Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Here we are to talk about peacekeeping and nonviolent conflict resolution. We are lucky to have with us Armstrong, Marcus Armstrong. He has been working for over 20 years in peacekeeping missions, and he has a, re a relevant and interesting experience on international support in times of violent armed conflict. He will talk about his experience, and then feel free then and during the talk, feel free to add any comment, any opinion, or any question because this will enrich the, the conversation. I'm happy to introduce you to Marcus. Hi, Marcus, welcome. Hi, Raquel, thank you so much for organizing this. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to share a bit of my work, thank you. So, um, I thought I'd just start about saying a very couple of minutes about myself and how I got to work in, in Iraq. Um, I'm 60 years old now. I have three daughters who are in their late 30s. I have three grandchildren now. They're very little, but growing up fast. Um, and from after I left school until I was about 30, I worked in information technology as a computer systems designer. And I got became quite depressed in this job because while it was quite a successful job for me and I enjoyed parts of it, I realized very much I wanted to be working in reconciliation, nonviolence, and peace work. So I had to make a difficult decision towards the end of my 20s and in my early 30s to actually leave that career behind and start over again in my 30s. Um, and I kind of spent my 30s um, working as an anti-nuclear and anti-war activist. And we were trained in groups to, um, protest against the use of nuclear weapons and against the war machine. Um, and um, this was a very formative time for me where I kind of was learning a whole new set of skills and becoming more involved in the activist life. And part of that work involved taking what we called nonviolent direct action against the weapons of war. So um, part of that involved trying to disarm nuclear weapons and the weapons of war. And of course, there is a consequence for this um, in England anyway. And so through the course of this work and challenging nuclear weapons and the war machine, I did get arrested, I can't remember, about 30 times. And I think I served about 17 prison sentences. And that was a very important time when <clears throat> I kind of took up my power and, and I was following my own heart and passion about the work I wanted to do. And then in the last 20 years, so in my 40s and 50s, I kind of retrained as um, a mediator, a peacekeeper and a negotiator. And I've kind of been doing this for 20 years now. And over that 20 years, I've made about 18 peacekeeping missions, 12 to Palestine and six to Northern Iraq. Um, and if someone had asked me maybe 20 years ago or more, if I'd be going to Palestine, Iraq, I probably would have said, no, I, I, that's too unsafe. I don't want to do that work. But the more I came to know about the difficulties faced by ordinary people living in these circumstances of violent armed conflict, the more I came to see there was, I felt there was an international, there should be an international commitment to support people living like this. Um, so I, I started working in Palestine and then about 10 years later, I got a request to work in Iraq, which I did. So this talk is about um, the trips I made to Iraq, mainly with an organisation called the Christian Peacemaker Team, um, CPT. And I'm not a practising Christian. Um, you don't have to be to join them. So I'd like to start by showing you a map of the area I was working in. Um, hang on, I need to share this, don't I? Share screen. So can everyone see that map? Daniel, Raquel, can you see the map? Hello. I'm going to carry on, assuming everyone can see the map. Yes, I, um, I think everyone. Okay, lovely. Thank you. So if you can see this, can you see my point of this? Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. And in the middle, in the grey area, there's an area called Kurdistan. Now, it's not a country. It's just the area where the Kurdish people live. 
And to my knowledge, the Kurdish people are the largest people um, known to exist in an area like this, but not have their own country or un their own control over where they live. And there are some 28 million um, Kurds living in southeast Turkey, northeast Syria, northern Iraq, and western Iran. Um, and the Kurds have a history of being oppressed um, by all the countries they live in. And they have a saying, which is that um, we have no friends but the mountains, because in times of great insecurity and violence, they often flee to the caves in the mountains. And that's one of the sayings they had. So this is the area I was working here, the bit of Iraq you can see that's in the north. So I'd like to show you um, some images from the country about the various work we did. So I'll show you some photographs from my blog first, just to give you an idea of how we live there. So I'm just gonna share again. So can you see the photograph of a bed in a room? Yep. Is that sharing, that's great. So. Just to give you an idea of how we lived there, this was my room when I was on team and the window had been blown out and for safety, we just bricked the window up, as you can see. And someone once said to me, oh, they look like nice curtains. <laughs> so we lived very simply there. And the Kurdish people live quite simple lives. They don't have a lot of furniture in their homes. And one of the lovely things about being on team in the Kurdish region was that when we weren't actually working and doing our peacekeeping work, we often spent a lot of time with families, which was very special. So this is one of the families, and this was the man here is one of our team members, and that's his family. Um, please feel free to ask any questions. So this slide shows you the team who um, I worked with on a couple of trips um, so on the left, you have a man from the Czech Republic. Then we have a Kurdish man. Then we have an 80-year-old Italian nun. And then we have a young American man. And then we have a Taiwanese woman. And we had me. So that was the makeup of the team on this trip. And Kurdistan is a stunning, northern Iraq is a stunning country. Um, extraordinarily beautiful and dramatic. Um, and we, have a, we had a lot of partner organisations um, who we worked with and the community there is very family oriented. So we spent a lot of time with their families as well when we weren't working. This was at a friend's wedding who I was the photographer at. And this is traditional Kurdish dress, you can see there. And these are some of the scenes from the rural country areas of Kurdistan where we often worked. This was helping with the um, harvesting of the fruit, the farmers. Some of the creatures in Kurdistan. Some of the very beautiful scenes there. And this picture is of um, one of the many uh, mass graves that was uncovered after Saddam Hussein was removed from power. Um, so these occur all over the country. So these would have been, were unsure if they'd have been villagers or um, people in transit or refugees but they were mass graves found and often it's very difficult, if not impossible, to identify the people in these graves after so long. So what the, the government is doing since Saddam Hussein was removed from power is they're trying to um, honour the dead in terms of excavating those graves and placing blank gravestones um, by the people.
And this is an example of the drawings on the wall of a church school because this is what young people experience there. It's barbed wire, it's mines, it's bombs. It's more example of some of the terrain. And just to show you, this is the team house we worked in. So this was our office and lounge where we worked. This was our kitchen, dining room. This was the house we lived in, in one of the towns near the Iranian border. And we happened to be right opposite a mosque. So the prayers were very loud. And lucky for us, most of the singers had reasonably good voices and stayed mostly in tune. There was, however, one man who didn't really sing very well in tune, and that was quite painful when he was on singing duties. And that's an example of the scenery. So I just wanted to introduce those images at the start, but I also want to tell you a little bit about the situation in northern Iraq, because it's quite complicated. So you've got Turkey in the north, Iraq in the south, um, Syria to the west, Iran to the east. You've got Iraqi Kurdistan in the middle of all those four countries with a border on all four of them. So Iraqi Kurdistan, the area where the Kurds lived in, nor in northern Iraq, borders Turkey, Iran, Syria and Iraq. And at any one time, there's often a lot of conflict going on along those borders. And the situation's made more complex by the fact that you've got rebel groups operating in the mountainous areas between those countries, between Kurdistan and Turkey, Iran, Syria and Iraq. Um, and because these Kurdish um, rebel groups are often attacking those countries, then those countries are attacking Iraqi Kurdistan back. In addition, you have a complex sort of political situation in that the Kurdish part of Iraq in the north has um, some degree of self-governance, but there are two political parties with their own armed groups fighting within that area as well. So it, it's a very, very complicated area to operate in. You've got Turkey attacking at the northern border, Iran attacking, elements from Syria attacking, fighting going on between Iraq and Iraqi Kurdish groups over the Kurdish rights. Additionally, you have two separate Iraqi Kurdish governments fighting many groups, and additionally, you have the rebel groups. So the whole situation is very unstable. And then, of course, in recent years, as you might know, ISIS took over large parts of these areas, including in Iraqi Kurdistan, and they destroyed a lot of those areas when they took it. And when the Allies took this land back from ISIS, much more destruction happened. So you've got, in addition to all these different groups, several different countries, several rebel groups, you've got um, two million refugees moving through um, this northern part of Iraq through Kurdistan, trying to get to Turkey and to Europe. Um, and they are fleeing various conflicts in the area. So as you can imagine, it's extraordinarily complicated. And, you know, one of the challenges in working there is many of the areas are unsafe and you can't travel them easily or you cannot travel um, or stay there at night. Or if, for example, something that happened to me once, I went somewhere for a particular piece of work that was maybe a day's travel away, then I didn't get back for three weeks because the areas were um, that the roads were closed. So there's an awful lot of security in place. There's an awful lot of paperwork to do to get to various places. And in addition to that, to give you a sense of probably most of the things we take for granted where we live, they don't have there. So there's no security. There's very limited freedom of movement. Um, if you've got running water, which not everyone has, it's not drinkable. Um, the electricity is off most of the time. Um, the governments are not functioning. The, um, the schools and universities are often closed. Um, there is no health care. 
So all the things we take for granted in terms of those simple um, aspects of daily life, probably for most of us listening to this, they don't have them there. And this has a massive impact on, on the community. And then they're suffering, many of them, a violent armed conflict or they're fleeing to try and get to safety. So it is kind of, there is, I don't know how you describe it, there's kind of a heart of darkness to these sorts of com conflicts. And the situations um, under which people are living are enormously complicated and enormously challenging. Um, and it is actually hard to speak of just ordinary people like you and I, our parents, grandparents, our children, grandchildren maybe, living and growing up under such circumstances with very few basic needs taken care of. Um, so life there for a lot of people is very, is, is, is very difficult. So the idea of the peacekeeping teams we put in place there is it's violence reduction. So there's we're aiming to protect people. We don't really operate on a political level heavily. We do exert political pressure. But the main idea is to place trained teams on the ground who can intervene directly in, 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 in situations of violence and try and reduce that violence and offer alternatives to violence um, to the groups. Um, and through this, we get involved in an enormous number of different aspects of communal life there, which I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about. So I just wanted to take a pause and see if anyone had any questions to ask right now. I'm happy to take questions as we go and to be interrupted. Um, so I'll just take a pause there to see if anyone has any question yet. I can't see anyone else, so I'm not sure who's in or I'm not receiving any messages. Shall I just carry on? Rekha? I would like to add something, but I think you are going to turn in a few. So I prefer you um, to... Mm, uh, wait, and then if you didn't say anything about what I'm doing. Okay. Okay. okay, that's fine. Thank you. So shall I carry on, Raquel? Is that okay? Come shall again? I continue? Shall I continue? If anyone, if nobody has any question, we can... And am I speaking slow enough and clear enough, or should I speak? I think so, yeah. Okay, please anyone tell me if I'm speaking too fast or not clearly enough. All for so, Okay, thank you. So um, I would like to share some pictures now and some stories about the various um, work we undertake. So um, one of the tasks we do is we um, act as a presence at protests. So I'll share screen and some pictures for you now. So one of the tasks we were often asked to do was to attend the protests of the local people um, who would be protesting about a wide range of issues. In this protest, they're protesting green issues and recycling. Um, because the people there, it's a risk to protest against the government in these areas. Um, and there can often be a high price to be paid. So the groups out there and the communities are getting better at mobilising to have safety in numbers and also asking for the support of international groups like us to um, support them, bear witness and intervene if things get too violent. So this protest was about um, re reduce, reuse, recycle and protecting Mother Nature. And this would be an example of what we'd be faced with if we were trying to protest or march through the city. Um, but some of the soldiers would receive plants from us, like you can see in this picture, and hold it. So I think some of the armed forces and the security forces there sympathised with what we were trying to do. Um, there were lots of protests every week about lots of different things. Some of them were about the environment. Some of them were about education or health care. Some of them were about corruption. Some of them were about um, friends or relatives being locked up for activism or for um, people being killed in other countries and surrounding countries. And while most of these protests remain quite peaceful, some of them could get quite violent and difficult. 
So these were families holding up posters of their um, sons or relatives who had disappeared. Or some of them who'd been killed. And this was a protest, I believe, outside the Iranian embassy in um, northern Iraq against um, the Iranians um, executing Kurdish prisoners. Sometimes these were extraordinarily emotional and painful, particularly when we were working with families who'd lost. Um, Could you remember the year that these photos were taken? The year these photos were taken, these would have been taken around in the last sort of eight years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So these were the police stopping the activists getting to the actual embassy. And really there were some very heartbreaking moments working with parents and relatives of people who disappeared or have been executed. This was a photo I wanted to share because we were, um, some members of the team were on our way to um, visit a village that had been attacked and to write a report on the attack. And we were trying to get to the village, but we had to stop because a group of young schoolgirls in their early teens, and this is one of the girls you can see, they had got so fed up with um, the schools being closed that they decided to have a protest of their own. So they wheeled out some tyres into the road and set them alight. And as you can see, this girl is recording it on her iPad or her tablet. And I felt very mixed about these actions. Part of me felt excited that um, young people are finding their power and standing up for themselves. Part of me also was worried for them and the possible consequences of these sorts of actions. So this is a complicated photo for me. Um, so I'd also like to share a video from the protests. So I'm going to share this screen. There's no audio, but this screen is from one of the protests, um, one of the mass protests in the city I was staying in where we were bearing witness. And there's always a, a risk when getting too close to the sort of heart of these protests that um, you're going to get shot at with rubber bullets or live bullets or you're going to get tear gassed or there's going to be stun grenades or there's going to be water cannon or you're going to be beaten by the security forces. And this was one situation just to give you a taste of some of the protests where we all got a bit too close to the, the front of the protests and we were all tear gassed and we were all running away. And I was running away backwards, um, trying to get to somewhere where I could get some water and, and rinse my eyes out. Um, so I'll just show you the video. Um, I couldn't see anything at this point because I'd been fairly well tear gas. I was just running backwards, trying to get away from it and trying to record the situation. And inevitably, I tripped over someone and fell. And that was that. So I hope that gives you some idea of the sort of that aspect of the work um, in terms of supporting protests locally and bearing witness and trying through our capacity as internationals and the power we hold through that to keep local people safe. Um, one of the other aspects of the, the work was support for refugees, refugee camps and a similar sort of task, bearing witness, sometimes trying to protect villages and places. So I hope you can see the screen of the scene by the river with the tents. I think I'm sharing that now. Please tell me if you can't see that. Um, yeah. So the refugee situation in 
this region is nothing short of a complete catastrophe and tragic. Um, as I said earlier, I think there's some two million or more refugees moving across this area. Some of the camps are like this, where you might just have a few families by river. Some of the camps hold 50,000 people. Um, very few of them are proper buildings, most of them are tents. So you have an enormously complicated refugee situation of um, people coming across all these four borders between Kurdistan and Turkey, Iran, Iraq and Syria. You also have the internal displacement due to the conflicts um, with ISIS. And they are living on, under extremely difficult circumstances through um, 40 degree heat in the summer, snow in the winter. Um, and that there simply are not enough resources to go around. There are far more refugees now in this region than there will ever be the resources to support properly. And it's just, it's just for me beyond words. Um, hello. Yeah. I have a question. There was any international support in that refugee camp or any organization working over there? Yes, there's there's lots and lots of support locally and internationally. Um, and that provides a really essential service, but it's just not enough. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very barely providing food and water. It's certainly not providing proper shelter or educational health care or trauma support or anything like that. So that's the challenge that, yes, there is a lot of organisations with a lot of means working there, but the situation I feel has gone too far and I don't see where the resources to support two million people there will come from very easily. Um, so some of these refugees are from, you know, across border refugees or from a long way away, but some of the refugees have just fled their farms and homes near the borders. I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. Um, so this is an example of the conditions people are living in. And just to share at this point that there, there were, um, with the organisation I was working with, I know it happened to other organisations, but we had two of our teams kidnapped uh, over, over the time we've been there. And um, there is a big, big criminal element operating in these areas and there's often a high reward considered for um, international peacekeeping teams. So two of our teams were captured, some people were killed. So this really changed how we could operate. We were no longer then in a position to just receive a phone call and get in a car and drive somewhere. We had to try very hard to um, try to verify that this call for help was real. If, for example, we got a call from a village near the border and they said Iran is shelling us, can you please come here and film it and write reports on it? Can you contact the Iranian authorities? We couldn't just get in the car and do that because that's how one of the teams was kidnapped. It was, a, it was a false call to a village where the team was then kidnapped. And this made our work really difficult because um, we then couldn't trust if certain calls for help were genuine or not without verifying that. Um, So I just wanted to explain a bit about the, the border situation. So if you think, for example, of the, the border to the east with Iran, where there are rebel forces operating, Kurdish rebel forces operating in, in the mountainous regions there who are attacking Iranian forces because of the way Iran is treating Kurdish people, Kurdish refugees, Kurdish dissidents. So effectively, the Iranian security forces are being attacked by rebel forces in the mountains. And they have, Iran has a significant army. So, for example, start shelling 
certain um, rural areas where they think the rebels might be? Well, the rebels are quite few in number relatively. They're on the move in a mountainous region. So the actions of, for example, the Iranian army in attacking these regions, the only effect it normally has is to disrupt village life because there's a lot of Kurdish villages in this area. So there's no major cities in this area, but there are um, lots and lots of villages. So I want to show you a bit about um, the impact of that. So I hope you can all see a picture of uh, a boy holding the rent, a piece of shell. So um, the people living in these rural areas along the border and in the mountains um, rely almost entirely on farming. So their farms are their livelihood. They, they farm to feed their family and the excess goods they sell to buy the things they need. So if they have to leave their homes because of the fighting and the shelling, then this is extraordinarily destructive because they've lost their home and they've lost their livelihood. So this series of photos just shows um, what's happening in some of these villages. So this is an example of the size of the shells that are landing in the villages. So this photo, I hope you can see, is um, the lounge. It used to be used as a lounge in one of the family homes. Um, a shell came through the roof, came through the first floor floor, and then landed up in the lounge. And even if the shells don't directly hit any homes, um, the shells are so large and so explosive that they, they will destroy all the windows in all the houses hundreds of yards around. So this was a very common sight, even if the homes aren't destroyed, um, the windows are blown out. And as quickly as they can be replaced, there'll be another attack. And that will happen. And this is an example of one of the farmers' fields where the crops have died because the farmers had to leave because they were under attack and they couldn't tend to their crops, so their livelihoods are lost. So this is causing poverty in terms of people not being able to live in their homes and not having a job and not having the means to support their family. And there is no social services as such out there, so... Another example of shells that are landing. Um, this was an example of where a shell had landed outside of the house, but bits of shrapnel had come through the metal doors and killed people in the house. And this was the hole in the roof where the shell had gone through. This was um, in one of the villages we worked with. This was the school rooms, the classrooms, but due to the shelling, the buildings had been quite damaged and they weren't safe anymore. And they didn't have the resources to replace them. So um, there's simply no school anymore. Children aren't home taught. So they're missing out on a formal education. They're missing out on that bonding with their friends and that time at school. Then the animals now use it and roam in and out. Unfortunately, hello. Sorry. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you, Raquel. Yes. I wanted to ask a question. Yes. <laughs> so you were working as a cultural mediator over there, right? Or this maker or... we had a variety we had a variety of roles sometimes it was mediation between parties that were in conflict sometimes it was negotiation sometimes it was it was peacekeeping between um, armed groups and civilians um, it was a lot of community support it was a lot of filming and reporting so there was quite a wide range of tasks there for us mm -hmm. and my question was um, what kind of difficulties you found uh, working in a working as a negotiator as a cultural mediator um in a cultural context that was new for you um 
I suppose the biggest one was the language. We often need to use translators because I'm not fluent in um, Kurdish or Arabic or, or the languages spoken there. So one of the big challenges was getting um, um, translators who we trusted to translate well and who were in tune with what we were trying to do. Um, I suppose another obstacle was um, people were very, very hurt and traumatised and thus they were very angry. Um, so sometimes the anger would come to us because we were trying to get them, we were trying to work on forgiveness and reconciliation and looking at alternatives to violence. So sometimes that anger sort of came our way. Um, and that was understandable really, because people are, are in kind of a living hell there in many ways. Um, so those were two of the challenges. I suppose sometimes people would say we didn't understand their culture, and we didn't appreciate what they'd been through. And that's probably true in certain ways. You know, we don't have a full understanding of the culture and we don't, we certainly haven't lived through what they've lived through. So we had to be very sensitive and careful that we were um, mindful of what people have been through, their feelings and their needs and their sensitivities and vulnerabilities around trying to bring some reconciliation and forgiveness to some situations when people have been really badly hurt and they wanted to hurt someone back or they wanted someone to pay. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Sorry, I was on mute. I was talking. <laughs> I, yes, sorry, I, I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> um, I, I guess you were you weren't alone. You were working in a team. And <laughs> We mostly worked in a team, yes. And I wanted to ask if the team was composed of people from different nationalities or mostly from from the local communities or? It, it was a mix. I think I showed you a slide earlier where the team who lived in the house, there was there were six people from six different countries. So there was a Kurdish man a Czech man, an Italian woman, myself, a Taiwanese woman, an American man. So that team who came in from outside to help was multinational. But for example, in the picture you're seeing now, which is of men repairing the school, I was actually, I went up to one of the villages alone and joined a local team. So then I was just one person from the international team who joined a local team to work in this area. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So in that case, the team was mostly Kurdish and me working here. So does that answer your question, Raquel? Shall I continue? Yes, yes, of course. Thank, okay, you. thank you. So this is an example of one of the schools in one of the villages which had been damaged by shelling. So that was another task we undertook if there was practical help needed during harvesting fruit or rebuilding we would take part in that and we would um, repair buildings as needed. So the situation in the borders was complicated and they were often dangerous places to go because of the security concerns. And we had a strange experience um, on one trip to one of the villages where we kind of forgot the protocols. Um, nothing very serious happened, but I'll explain a bit more. We've been asked to one of the villages near the border in the mountain region to go and film and take witness statements because they've been attacked. Certain villages have been killed. Um, and while we were there, we got a call from another village who had no road access. So the only way we could get to them was by walking cross country. And we decided as a team, that we would make this journey to this other village to um, try and support them as much as we could. And we didn't realise we'd kind of entered some of the rebel areas um, and we were actually picked up by the rebels in that area 
including some of the rebels who were like 12, 13, 14 years of age, carrying belts of bullets across their shoulder and having guns, which was quite shocking in itself. Um, and it was a bit of a scary moment because we thought, oh, goodness, we're in real trouble here. We've wandered into this rebel territory. They don't know who we are. But luckily, after we had a conversation with them, um, they appreciated that we were there primarily to support the Kurdish people and to reduce violence. And then the energy changed and they actually invited us back to the rebel camp for kind of to have a drink and some cake and stuff. And we didn't really want to refuse them, but if the Iraqi authorities had found out we did that, we could have been in serious trouble and the team could have been kicked out. So we had to politely and sensitively refuse this offer and say we, we were on our way to support this village. But then something bizarre happened, which I suppose is one of the things that sums up um, the situation and the kind of the madness at the heart of this situation was that these this group of rebels then said, well, you need to register with us. We will take your details and we'll tell the other rebels in the area who you are and what you're doing here, that you're here to support the Kurdish people. And so you shouldn't have any more trouble. And I just thought I, I couldn't have made up this story if I tried about being stopped by the rebels and then being invited for tea and cake and then registering with them so that they knew of our presence there. So um, and, and we all got back okay in, in, the, in that situation. Um, I think there were something I'd like to explain now, which is about the honor, honor killings. Do you, um, does everyone know what an honor killing is? Does anyone need that explaining? Can you repeat it, please? Do, you, do people know what an honor, honor killing is? H O N O U R killing. Mm, Shall I explain? Know. Shall I explain? <laughs> please, please let me know if anyone doesn't understand. Um, so there, there is a, in my opinion, a very strange um, and difficult to understand system of honour in some communities in this area, whereby, um, for example, a daughter is particularly directed against women because it's a very male-dominated society. And it's where, for example, if a daughter grows up, then she must agree to an arranged marriage to marry someone who's chosen by her parents. She must agree to study certain things or not study certain things. And if she disobeys this, um, some families think that this brings dishonour or shame or embarrassment on the family and they must kill their daughter. So an honour killing is where um, it's usually women, young women, they are killed because they will not do what their father or husband or brothers tell them. Does that make sense? Has, has anyone heard of this? Does everyone understand what that means before I continue? Yeah, I, I understand it. Is that clear? Does anyone want to ask a question about that before we continue? I guess there, uh, there isn't any law protecting these, these young girls, right? Right. That's, that's a complicated question. That's a really good question. Thank you for asking that. And it's complicated because in some places there are very few laws, but in some places there are very clear laws against this, but they are not enforced by the authorities. So one of the things we became aware of, and please, please do stop me if you've got any questions about this. One of the things we became aware of through being in our community in, in northern Iraq, the Kurdish region, was that um, honour killings were happening in our community there and many women were living in fear um, 
of being killed. And I just want to share a couple of stories and then tell you how I feel about this because it was an enormously complicated issue for me. Um, so we got involved in the honour killing simply through people saying, please help us, please come and intervene in this situation where maybe a, a, a husband, a brother or a father is threatening harm on a female because they are not doing what they're told to do. Um, or we got women coming to our door asking for help. And it was a difficult situation for us, but we decided eventually that we would open up the basement, the underground part of our house as a kind of safe house for women under threat. Um, and in addition to providing a safe space, we would also enter into negotiations and mediations with families to try and prevent harm to women or killing to women. Um, and it was a dangerous thing for us to engage in because we didn't know who then, as an angry husband or an angry brother or an angry father, could turn up on our doorstep with a gun or a knife threatening us because we're supporting a woman in this situation. Is this clear so far? Shall I carry on? You can. I'll carry, I'll carry on, yeah. So I just want to share two stories. So this picture is of a woman who um, I think she was about 19 and she, she was at teacher training college and she fell in love with another student on her course. And she came to us for support because her father and brother were very angry that she'd fallen in love with a fellow student and she wanted to have a love marriage, whereas her family, particularly her father and brothers, wanted her to have an arranged marriage to one of her cousins. And I think this woman, um, she knew it was a, a difficult situation and she knew there was a risk, but I'm not sure she ever really believed that anything really serious would happen. But what did happen eventually, after some months of this situation ongoing, was that I don't know the exact details, but her father and brother caught her one day when she came home and they killed her, they knifed her to death on the front door of the house and they left her there to die. Um, and I am quite lost for words about such a situation. I have three daughters myself who are now in their late 30s and I have grandchildren and I cannot understand in any way how somehow it would be more honourable to kill my daughter rather than her choose a love marriage or choose what she wanted to study or live how she wanted to live. And I must admit, after this woman was killed, I feel it was one of the few times my sanity was threatened. I, I went to sleep thinking about it. I woke up thinking about it. I dreamt about it. I was very upset and tearful. And I could not come to terms with it. I could not understand it. And it really drove me mad. I mean, and I had to go through a process of getting support and moving on from it because there wasn't one single cell in my body that could understand how a father could kill his own child. And it made me realise that while there are many very, very important and special aspects of family life in this part of the world in terms of community sharing, support, there's also a really dark side to the community and the society there in that this is something that happens regularly. So we couldn't save this woman and that will always be a regret for me. That threatens to bring me to tears whenever I think about it. Um, but I, I, 
a question before going yes, to please. Please. Um, Do you know if there is any social initiative to change this type of marriages? I mean, an initiative promoted um, by any NGO or any international organization to change this, um, this part of the culture? Yes, yes. There's, 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 there's lots of local groups, so Kurdish and Iraqi groups working there, and there's lots of international groups working on things like arranged marriage, female genital mutilation, um, and um, honour killings, and generally working on women's rights. And in fact, I was working with one of the groups on my last couple of trips, and they had been active for 10 years as a group of women to change the local laws um, to protect women's rights. And they, they won this after 10 years, they got the laws changed, but the local authority were not um, um, implementing the laws. So then they faced perhaps another five or 10 years struggle to pressure the local authority to actually enforce the laws. So there is a lot of work going on, but it is deeply embedded, particularly in middle-aged and older people there. The younger generation with the internet and with social media are very, very different to middle-aged and older people there. And in fact, there's a there's kind of a, a war going on with this within this community about young modern Iraqis and Kurds against their elderly siblings or parents or grandparents because they feel very differently about these things. Um, and that in itself is another cause of conflict. Does that help, Raquel? Yeah, uh, thank you. And also Sonia in the chat wrote a question. I'm going to read it. Yeah. Uh, what about UN? Uh, and if Kurdistan is not a country, can it be protected by the UN? Um, that's a good question to which I don't know the answer. Um, Certainly the United Nations operates there, but not in a peacekeeping capacity. They're not providing protection to my knowledge, in you know, military protection. But um, I'm sorry, I don't have any more information on that. Okay, thank you. you can continue. So can I continue, Raquel? Yes, please. <laughs> thank you. So this photo, I've blanked out the face of the mum, but this was a woman who came to us with her son who was under threat of, of an honour killing because she had decided to move to Europe for the safety of her family and she actually had refugee status in Europe and she'd come home to visit because an elderly relative was dying and her, her father and her brothers had taken her passport and all her papers and money and they were threatening her. So she came to us and we, we housed her in our basement for some weeks with her son. But after about two weeks in the hot season, it had become very difficult for them to be stuck inside, especially for the, 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 the young boy. So one night, and when it was dark, we took them up to the mountain's edge to overlook the city just to get them out of the house um, under cover of the night. And this was um, a success in that we managed to negotiate with her family to get her passport back, to get her money and her papers back. And, we, uh, and then we provided accompaniment. We escorted her to the airport and out of the country. So... As you can see from these two examples, we, in many situations, we cannot stop people being killed. Um, but in many situations, we can intervene um, and carry out a mediation or a negotiation and prevent harm and actually get people to safety. And in relation to this, this, was an, this relates to another task we undertook, which was called accompaniment because it's often quite dangerous for um, Kurdish activists to travel in, long, in the country because they could be attacked by the security services, they could disappear. Um, and so one of the roles we undertook was to simply escort people across the country. If they were leaving or if they were entering, we'd meet them at the airport 
and escort them to their village or home or vice versa, we'd escort them out of the country or if they were giving important talks or lectures or had to attend to another city or village, we would um, accompany them there and back to keep them safe. So I don't know if you have any questions on the honour killings. If anyone has any. Mm, for the moment, nobody has read any questions. Okay. Shall I continue then? Yes, please. Okay, I just wanted to share um, a little bit about the marshlands. I don't know if you, uh, how many people are aware, but there's, there's a massive marshland in southern Iraq and western Iran called the Mesopotamian marshes. And these were an extraordinarily precious um, area because they were a wetlands in the middle of deserts and they were home to very diverse life and ecology. So these aren't clear pictures because they're very old, but I'll enlarge them. Can you see them, Raquel? Mm, not now. Not now. Hang on, I need to share. Sorry. I'll share. Can you see that now? So these were the Mesopotamian marshes stretching for hundreds of miles in southern Iraq. And um, they were a complete haven for um, wildlife. And there were many people living there under the most amazing um, circumstances of living on little pieces of land, as you can see, and building a home. And everything's carried out on the water, the markets, transport and everything and it was one of the most rich and diverse areas for plant and animal life on the whole planet what happened in the 60s and 70s is some of the marshlands were drained and reclaimed for oil and for agriculture but when saddam hussein came into power he started draining the marshes to evict the Shia Muslims and evict any rebels or dissidents who would go and hide there because it was a difficult area to get into and access. And by the time the end of Saddam Hussein's um, years in power came in, the majority of the marshlands were drained. And here you can see them in their glory and how people lived. It's not a clear photograph, but I think it gives you a picture how people lived there. Um, and so after sort of several decades of um, draining the marshes, I've got some pictures of what they looked like afterwards, which I'll share with you. So they effectively became a desert. There are some questions in the chat. Uh, okay. Should I... Yes, please do. So Mirte, I'll just say this is, yes, please. Thank you. Mirte says, how do people who might become a victim of honor, honor killing find your organization and how do they contact you? Um, well, usually that would be by word of mouth. We don't formally advertise this support because it's a sensitive situation because we are only there because we have permission to be there by the authorities. And if we um, press the authorities too hard or pressure them or criticize them or are too um, vocal about what we do and what we're offering, it could risk our presence. So normally this would be by us living in a community and through word of mouth in that community, people come to know what we're offering. Does that help? And the other question of Mirte is, can that already be a danger in itself? Sorry, I didn't understand that, Raquel. Can... Well, Mirte, her second question was, can that already be a danger in it, itself? When the person mm -hmm. for for your contact to, to have any help, is that a danger for, for the person? Yes, yes. Um, this is where the situation is very random and chaotic because 
some families, when they find out that their daughter or their sister have gone to an international organisation, they might back down and be willing to negotiate. <coughs> but some families might become even more angry and might become more violent. So there's always a risk of that if any of the women get help. We're never quite sure how the family will respond. And that's just a sad fact of the situation that the women trying to get help could increase the level of violence against them. Thank you. And Nina also has a question mm -hmm. about honor killings. Did you ever succeed to persuade family not to kill or punish a woman? If so, how? Um, yes, we had, among the many failures we had, we did have a significant number of successes by simply um, trying to maybe use a sympathetic family member to explain that we would like to enter into a negotiation or a mediation with the family um, to try and see if there were other options in this situation rather than harm coming to a woman. So we never knew what sort of reaction we were going to get. But as, as much as there are people out there who do not wish to negotiate and do not wish to compromise and will not listen, some people and some families were prepared to listen and receive support in a difficult situation to try and resolve this and keep everyone safe. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Yeah. So shall I continue, Raquel? Yes, please. So this, this is what the marshes look like after several decades of draining. Can you see the picture? Yes. So one of the first things that happened when Saddam Hussein was removed from power was that thousands and thousands of people across the um, Mesopotamian marsh region, they started destroying all the dams that had been put up to direct water away from the marshes. And I believe, having worked with some organisations that are trying to restore the marshes, they are more than 50% restored. So the marshes are coming back. Um, a lot of the people are not returning because they have made their lives elsewhere. But it seems as though um, the ecostructure has largely survived. The seeds were still there, so the plants are coming back. The animals are coming back. Um, the people are not coming back in large numbers. Some are. But there is long-term projects um, who are doing amazing work in this region to restore the marshes and bring back this important ecological and environmental area in the middle of the desert there. Any questions so far? I can't hear you. Oh. Yes, sorry. I was unmuting it. Uh, for the moment, nobody has said any questions. Okay. Um, I'm just looking if I've got any more particular things I wanted to share. Oh, yes. I'd like to share a little bit about the training I did when I was there because um, some trips were very frontline trips um, and very, very challenging in that sense and very dangerous. But some trips um, I went on, I spent a considerable amount of my time training groups of people. So I want to show you some of the groups I trained and share some of the stories from that. So because of the dreadful situation that the communities there are living in, and because of the stress and the trauma that everyone is under, not only are these communities dealing with a lack of security, a lack of water, a lack of electricity, no education, no health care, no freedom of movement, 
they're also dealing with a massive rise in conflict within their community because people are under so much stress and pressure. And again, this was another thing that was quite tragic for me to see that it's almost like it's become like a pressure cooker and the pressure builds and builds and builds and then it explodes within families and within villages and, and within areas. So one of the big initiatives was to try and start to build capacity within the communities in non-violent conflict resolution, in mediation, in reconciliation, in forgiveness. So on some of my trips, I ran a program of workshops. So this included training groups as mediators, which was a minimum of seven days. Um, training groups as negotiators, as peace workers, how to deal with um, armed conflict situations. Um, and in the principles of nonviolent conflict resolution. But alongside that, we had a program of more reflective workshops on things like forgiveness. Um, and sort of very closely related to the nonviolence, but more reflective. So they were very exciting and really um, fun. And also quite difficult because all the people there had their stories to tell and many of them had lost a lot and were quite traumatised. So, um, and then we tried to get sort of training for trainers organised so that once mediators had some experience, then they could train as a trainer to start sort of spreading, um, you know, the models. So these are some of the groups I worked with who were having a series of workshops. Now this group um, that you could see now, they were from four villages in the east of this region by the Syrian border and their villages had all been taken over by ISIS whole area had been taken by ISIS and they'd all had to flee. And since ISIS had been driven out, they were returning to um, their villages and they were trying to open up peace houses. So they would, they would find the funding to rent a house and that house would then become a center for people who needed support, people who needed training, and for them to start building the capacity in their own communities. Um, and I actually got to visit these villages as part of the work because after they'd been trained in the city, they went back to their villages and I've, I worked in the villages then and, and it was difficult for them because the villages had been very much destroyed. Either ISIS had destroyed it when they took it or the, the allied forces had destroyed it very much taking it back from ISIS. So there wasn't a lot left in a lot of these villages. And I was actually amazed at the human spirit of these young people who were going back to try and rebuild and to try and open a peace house and try and support their local communities. And it was very, very moving for me, very touching. This was a woman's group in one of the villages who had their peace house, as you can see behind them. And they were very much taking up their power as women to say, we can meet alone. We can mobilize alone. We can get trained as a group of women. We don't need men. And we can then offer support to our local community. So this was the end of one of the mediation trainings for the people who passed the training, they got their certificates and they were heading back to their villages. And this last picture is, is very meaningful for me. Um, this was a group of women I got to know in one of the outlying villages who most of them were refugees. Most of them had lost their homes, their possessions. Many of them were widows because their husbands had been killed or they didn't know where their husbands were. And they were living 
in this small village and they decided to rent a house and start providing support for each other and the community. And I was put in touch with them through contact and they said we would just love to have whatever training you can give. So over one trip, I think they had about eight training courses, mediation, negotiation, nonviolent communication, forgiveness, um, reconciliation. Um, and I, I was so deeply, my heart was so deeply touched by them and their stories and what they'd lost and the fact that despite all of that they they were actively engaging in trying to make peace in their community and support everyone and you know there i worked with many amazing groups there but they're a group i'll never never forget and i and you know I, i'd love to go back and work with them again if i get the opportunity So I think I've shared a lot with you about the work. There's an awful lot more I could share. I mean, really, I could talk to you for a day or two about all the things there and all the things that happened. But I think I've said enough now. So I'd really welcome any questions or any comments or anything anyone would like to share. But I, th I don't want to overload people. So I think that's enough for now. Thank you, Marcus. I have a question. Yes. Have you ever felt, well, you have worked uh, around the world, let's say, you have worked in different countries, different continents. Um, have you ever felt that your work as a negotiator, as a cultural mediator, as a, as a trainer, uh, could have a negative impact in the community you were working with? And if so, how did you manage? That's, that's a really important question. Thank you, Raquel. I think... The groups I work with, including Christian peacemaker teams, we only go to a country by invitation. And that's really important for us. We don't just turn up somewhere and say, hey, we know you've got problems, can we support you? We, don't, we wait and we have people in these countries who make people aware that these peacekeeping teams are available to come and live in the communities and work. And so we have to receive a formal request for support. So we hope through that process that um, the local community um, has considered this request of us to come and support them. However, um, in Palestine, not in, this happened more in Palestine, when the peacekeeping teams, the main purpose was intervening in armed conflict between the Palestinians and the Israeli army, we did get some situations where the Israeli army threatened us and said, if you don't leave and stop interfering with what we're doing here, as soon as you have to leave, we're going to kill them. We're going to really punish this community. And that was a really serious threat for us because that was happening. So all we could do in those situations was go back and engage with the local community, with the people who invited us to come and all the other people we knew and say, look, do you want us here? And overwhelmingly, every single time we entered into that conversation, the local community said, the Israeli army is killing us anyway. They're stealing our land anyway. If you go, there's no one to bear witness. There's no one to film. There's no one to go home and talk about it. There's no one to report on it. So we, I have never personally been in a situation where the community thought it was worse for us to be there and has asked us to leave. I've never, I've never been in that situation. I've never heard of it. Um, but it is serious. It is serious. And there were some situations where we intervened in in Palestine which um, there could have been some very serious consequences, but in the moment we had to make a judgment of we do we try and prevent further harm and suffering, even if there's a risk. And I think they were very difficult choices. And I think for me, I did live a lot of my life making decisions out of fear 
what would happen if I did that? What could I lose? What could people say? What could happen? And that wasn't really a very happy way for me to lead my life, always making decisions based on fear. I, I would prefer to make my decisions based on faith and hope. And so I think a lot of the decisions we made in these situations were based on faith and hope. And, you know, sometimes, Raquel, and this is a hard one, this is a hard one, but sometimes there's a time and place to do the right thing no matter what happens. Sometimes you just have to stand up for people and you have to stand and be counted and you can't worry about the consequences, otherwise you would never act. And I suppose I can just knock wood and say, you know, I've been beaten up, I've been shot at, but there's never been any life-threatening, for me, consequences of doing this work. But they have been for other people. Like, you might have heard of Rachel Corrie or Tom Herndl. They were two young people who I was working with in Palestine who both lost their lives for doing this. So there is, of course, a risk. I mean, there's a risk of stepping outside your front door, but there's a bigger risk of going to a conflict zone. Is it worth it? Absolutely. We have to show international solidarity. We have to stand up for each other. And certainly for me, if I think about my daughters living in England, let's say England was ever invaded, I would actually have a really solid expectation that the international community would come to our support. I wouldn't expect them to say, oh, well, they're far away or they're a different people or that's their problem. I would expect the international community to come to the support of vulnerable people or people in need or people who are suffering. So that puts a responsibility on me to offer that support where I can. Does that make sense? I totally agree. Thank you, Marcus. Mm, Sonia has a question. During these years that you have been working, have you seen evolution or change in the resolution of conflicts without violence? I mean, have you seen the results results of your fight, of your work? Yes, but only on local small levels. We haven't seen a change in these major conflicts happening between countries. But what we do see is in places where we can go and work and build skills and offer another way, those communities are usually really hungry to keep themselves safe and prevent conflict and make things safer and work on forgiveness and reconciliation. They've suffered enough. They want a different way. So in many of those situations on a local, small level, yes, it can be very transforming. The work is to build that so it makes international change and it starts influencing on that level. But yes, many, many successes in, the, in these situations, yes. Thank you. Does anybody has any question? Mm. For the moment, nobody says anything. Okay, well, there's just one of the... Just, can I just share one more thing? I think, obviously, there's a risk to going to a conflict zone in terms of there's a, there's a chaos there, there's a randomness, there's armed conflict going on. But I've actually found one of the biggest prices I had to pay for this work was at home with my family because I, I had a very strong passion to do this work and I was very compelled to do this work. And it was very important for my own mental health and well-being to be empowered and to be supporting people globally and to be part of the international community and showing that solidarity. But a difficult aspect for me was I had three young girls, my daughters growing up in England, and on many occasions they said to me, Dad, we don't want you going to prison anymore for your anti-nuclear activities. We don't want you going to Palestine or Iraq. We're scared for you. And... I went anyway. I did those things anyway. So there has been a cost in things like that. And I think it's a bit better now that they've grown up, particularly one of my daughters who came with me on some peace work. So she had first-hand experience of this. But I do know that it's come at a cost to not honour my daughter's wishes when they were young and stop 
getting arrested, stop going to prison, stop going to the Middle East. And so there's as much reconciliation and forgiveness for me to do at home as there has been in these conflict zones to engage in this. And that's been very real. Yeah. Thank you. And I have a final question. Mm -hmm. um, could you give any advice to people interested in working in non-violent conflict resolution, in peacekeeping, in international negotiation? Any advice? Yes, I mean, there's there's various avenues into it. I mean, you could go down a sort of a very formal avenue of getting your degree in these studies and joining something like the UN or other groups who are working out there. That's one path. Um, But there's also a lot of less formal paths. There's a lot of organisations out there. I mean, I could supply information on them if anyone wants to know, who are working in a different way. That if you pass their um, if you pass their interviews and you pass their training, then you can join one of their teams. So it would be a case of sort of thinking about what's the sort of work you want to do. Are there any particular places you'd like to work, or is it general? And then exploring what groups are working in those areas, what they offer, and how you can get to work with them. I mean, the way in for some organisations is um, to volunteer with them. For example, when I became a mediator, I wasn't in a position to retrain as a mediator. I had a young family. I couldn't go off to university for three years. So what I did was I trained for free with an organisation who I then had to volunteer for for two years. So there are ways and means to get these skills without having to have a lot of money or time. It might involve a bit of exploration, but you know, as I say, I came in informally and I was trained by NGOs and peace groups who were looking to place mediators and peacekeepers in, in these situations. So there's a lot of avenues from the very formal to the very informal. Um, and certainly if anyone wanted more information about that, I could talk to them about that one on one resources. Thank you very much. Um, it was very inter interesting, very uh, touchful. And I think nobody has any question. Mm, say goodbye to the talk if you um so I think this is the end of the of the conversation. Raquel, thank you so much for organizing this. I know we've been talking about this for six months and I'm so grateful that you have You've had such passion and commitment to make this happen. And I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to share this work. And please, for everyone, if they want to keep in touch with me, um, you can feel free to give my email or telephone number. And I'd love to hear from anyone who'd like to find out more, has got any other questions. And if you know of any other groups who might want to talk on such work, then please let me know. Can you write your email or to so people can write Can I write it, it now? You want. So people, yeah, so people can see it in the in the screen. And Danny, I think you have to. That's my email. I've sent it. Have you got it? Yeah. Um, Danny, can you do something so it's on the screen? I don't know. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, he can't put it on the screen. So the email okay. is this. Barra baja, I don't know how is the line underline. Underscore. <laughs> Marcus, uh, I don't remember how to say arroba in English. At, at. at Yahoo. Point. Co. Point UK. <laughs> so you can contact. Thank you so much, Raquel. Ah, right. Oh, there it is. There it is. Well done. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> brilliant. Thank you, Danny. Okay. Thanks again for Daniel for sorting out the technical stuff. And thanks yeah. again for Raquel. And thanks everyone who's come on board. I, I couldn't see anyone, so I don't know who was there, but thank you for listening. And look after yourselves and be safe thank under you. COVID. And thank you never you. know when we might meet again. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Thanks, Raquel. Take care. Take care. Bye.